Well, you're most welcome to today's talk. It's Wednesday, the 15th of September. And I really appreciate you sticking with me during the poorer quality videos when we were working out of town. Thankfully, we're working from home again now. Now, we've been wondering for some time what's going to happen this autumn. And it's remarkably interesting in, in a strange kind of way how similar the patterns are between the United Kingdom and the United States. Now, I want to focus on the United Kingdom today, but a lot of what I'm going to be talking about applies wherever you live in the world. There's a lot of general principles. Now, let's just look at a few orientation slides from the United Kingdom. First of all, these from the prime minister's uh, meeting yesterday. These were the chief medical officer's slides that he showed during that occasion. So a number of people testing positive for COVID-19. Well, you can decide where that is. I'd say it's kind of level, really, overall, in terms of people testing positive. But when we move on to the number of people in hospital with COVID-19, I'm afraid we do see that that is going up gradually. So this is the number of people actually in hospital at the moment. So we see on the 10th of September, OK, it's five days ago now, but that was 8,256 people and it is going up slightly in terms of people actually in hospital. Nothing like where we were on the previous peak, but with more to say on that. Deaths, again, they are going up and, you know, there's still quite a few deaths per day here. So um, the most recent seven day average up to a few days ago, 141 deaths per day. This is not nothing. This is not insignificant. Number of people who've had received a vaccine for COVID-19 in the United Kingdom. Well, these are actual numbers. So we see these are going up quite nicely for both doses and the first dose. 48.4 million individuals have received a first dose. Of these, 44 million have also received a second dose. So there's only about 20 million total population left to go to get vaccines and about 5 million people who are eligible to be vaccinated who haven't yet been vaccinated. And we'll look at what some of the implications or potential implications for these people now. Um, COVID-19 cases come into emergency care within 28 days of a diagnosis. Now, these are age groups here. So uh, under age, uh, under 18, of course, not many uh, vaccinated yet, although that is changing. Um, 18 to 29. So this is uh, two vaccinated. This is the unvaccinated. And you can see that going up to the age group. So when we're in the 70 to 79 year old age group, this is the proportion that are doubly vaccinated. This is the proportion that are unvaccinated. So we see that um, someone in their 30s there who is unvaccinated has roughly the same risk of someone in their 70s who is vaccinated. This is the level of protection we're getting from the vaccines. And of course, this is despite the fact that now there's way more people in the country who are vaccinated than unvaccinated. So um, there are the rates per 100,000. So um, that's, that's, that shows you the level of protection of the, of the vaccines in terms of hospitalisation. It's nothing like where we would like it to be. I can't help feeling a bit disappointed, but Patrick Valance, the chief scientific officer, said these vaccines are remarkably effective compared to what we could have had and the expectations. So we have to be grateful for what we've got and who we are, because without this, things would not be good at all. Deaths within 28 days of a positive test by vaccination status. And again, thankfully, we're not seeing deaths in the younger age groups or very minimal amounts. Again, each one is a complete tragedy. But uh, if we look at the uh, 70 to 79, these are deaths in people with two uh, doses of vaccine. These are deaths in the unvaccinated. So we see really quite a stark difference there. Now, what I want to talk about now mostly is, is this. Um, this is the paper. Um, I'm going to show you this paper here in a bit of detail today. Um, that's the paper we're talking about there. We'll show you the direct link for that now, but it gets a bit confusing just looking at it on its own. So we're going to go through that a bit. Now, I just want to start off with something uh, interesting here. Eight week scenario for daily hospital admissions in England. This is what's going to happen over the next eight weeks. Now, if the R rate stays round about where it is now, kind of one, about one as we are at the moment. Let's, let's suppose the R rate was 1.1, then that gives us the green scenario. Um, if the R rate is 1.5, that gives us the blue scenario. And if the R rate is two, that gives us the red scenario. And we don't really care about number of people testing positive. What we're interested in is the level of people being hospitalised. And this applies to the United States only more so because there's a larger proportion of people in the United States unvaccinated. There's still a whole nation of people 
in the United States not vaccinated. So let's uh, look at that. So here we have it here. So these are the hospitalisation figures at the moment, bumbling along at a fairly low level. But of course, autumn has to come. Now, we know it's the 15th now. This is always a bit out of date. But these are hospitalisations per day. Now, first of all, we have the green scenario here with the low R value. And what we're seeing is that as the cases increase with the R value being above one, we do get more hospitalisations. And these are the kind of uh, interquartile ranges around here. So it could be sort of down here, it could be up here. That These estimates are hard to, to figure out. But what we do see is that even with an R rate of 1.1, we could be up to about 2,000 hospitalizations per day, way higher than we are at the moment where we're kind of down in those levels. But then if we increase the R rate to um, 1.5, with each person infecting 1.5 other people, then I'm afraid the hospitalization rates shoot up really quite dramatically to well over 6,000 per day. And again, these are the interquartile ranges here. So you can't predict exactly where it would be, but it's within these kind of levels. The solid line is the most likely level. So we see in, in six weeks time, really quite five, six weeks time, really quite dramatically high levels of hospitalization, which would be not good uh, at all. But then if the R value was two, which we're not expecting, but if it were to be two, then I'm afraid the graph kind of goes off the scale. And, and this is a direct copy from the uh, from the site. So you can make that top line kind of where you'd want it to be up to sort of 10, 11, 12,000 hospitalizations per day, quite potentially unsustainable uh, levels. Let's hope that that is not, uh, is, is not the case. But it is a less likely scenario because that's kind of where we are at the moment heading into autumn now of course the numbers in the United States and other countries would be different um, but the overall proportions and trends will be similar so it is it is quite possible and in fact it's much more likely in the states that hospitalizations are going to go out of control I, I'm always being told off for being alarmist but I'm really concerned about hospitalizations in the states going up in autumn dramatically based on this data from the UK and the fact that there are more unvaccinated people in the United States than in the UK. So that is why I am concerned. Now, um, I want to give you a bit of detail on this now from this from this report. So if hospitalisation is likely to rise. So we're looking at 2,000 to 7,000 per day next month. Now, this this is still a question mark. We're, we're still hoping it's going to be here, but, but they are going to rise because the vaccines have not completely broken the link between hospitalisations and deaths. So government's got a plan B. So basically, uh, the prime minister is saying, well, um, plan A is we carry on with very loose restrictions as we are now. Plan B is we have to have some restrictions in place. But the point is now there's so many people with a, some degree of immunity. So I think it's about 94, probably even 95 percent of people now have some antibodies or some evidence that they've had this infection or the vaccine or been exposed to the antigen in some way to develop some antibodies. So there's a lot of immunity out there. So what that means is relatively minor modifications like people just wearing uh, face face coverings in public areas or, or, or just a, a couple of million people working from home could be enough to make a big difference because of the large proportion of people that are already uh, immune. So like like um, a year ago, when what was, where are we now? September. So no one was vaccinated a year ago. Um, then those little differences would have made essentially no difference to the overall amount of people getting the, the infection and getting hospitalised because there was so much less immunity around. So little changes could be required. We're not talking about another lockdown. Little changes could be required to have a big influence. And that's the same to remember in the United States as well. So little influences like less social mixing, like a bit of common sense, a bit of common decency in, in face coverings, uh, more people being vaccinated, few more people working from home, less social interactions. That could make all the difference. And the calculations changed completely in the last few days because we now know in the UK people over the age of 50 are going to be getting a third dose of vaccine. So now that I know I'm going to be getting a third dose of vaccine, um, I don't want to get uh, in, exposed now. Because I know I'm getting a third dose of vaccine and I know my protection will be much greater after the third dose of vaccine. So I'll wait to be exposed uh, or take 
the m m more chances after my third dose of vaccine when firstly I'm less likely to spread it to other people and I'm less likely to get seriously ill myself. So the dynamic has changed a lot in the last few days. What we want to really do now is focusing on reducing these infections and apart from anything else so we don't get the red line because that would be potentially uh, potentially disastrous. Uh, well, unmanageable. People would die if that happened. So government's plan B. So uh, Sir Patrick Vallance saying basically if you're going to make a move it's got to be earlier than you think and more dramatic than you think. So basically um, the Prime Minister talking about his plan B and Patrick Vallance talking about this means that the two of them together are giving themselves quite a bit of a uh, wiggle room as we would say uh, in England. Now this report here that we were mentioned here that's this one do look at it for yourself it's um, it's it's pretty intelligible actually it's not it's not written in sort of scientific gobbledygooky gooky language it's actually pretty good you can you can you know if you're prepared to take two or three hours over it you can you can read it and make a good a, a good job of it um, anyway, um, this is the scientific pan, pan scientific pandemic influenza group on modelling. So pan, for groups for pandemic and influenza. So that's COVID and and influenza. But of course, influenza can be pandemic as well. Um, so and, and presumably they're they're. Uh, that stand, I don't know what the O stands for, actually. Someone let me know. Organisation or something. I don't know what it stands for. But it's a scientific pandemic influenza group on modelling. And they report, of course, to SAGE, Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. The UK is currently experiencing high prevalence and, and uh, likely entering a period of growth because of the time of year, I'm afraid. It's a time of significant uncertainty, but the school holidays are basically over. So we've got children going back to school. We've got children mixing at school. A big factor, of course, as we have known for a long, long time now. Um, possibility of, uh, of further evidence to emerge on the duration of immunisation against COVID-19. So they're saying here, basically, we don't know about the longevity of immunity that we're going to get from natural infection, although we're still optimistic about that. We're thinking about three years hopefully or more on that um, but the protection of the vaccines we know it's going down uh, against symptomatic disease and it's a case of how much that goes down against hospitalizations and severe illness at the moment not very much but the trend is there that's that's the concern so the modeling is ambiguous because that term is not fully understood uh, possibly broader longer peaks than the, the uh, original estimates that they had so in other words more likely to be in this green scenario with a not 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 so high peak, but potentially a longer one, because if you think about it, this is quite high levels of people here being hospitalised for quite a long period of time. It's not as if it's shooting up, then shooting down again. This is going on. Well, well, that, that takes us up to the 2nd of November. So this is going on till basically well into December with increased hospitalizations. is a possible scenario. Potential for another large wave of hospitalizations is what we are worried about. We don't know, but they are saying there's this potential. We hope not. And especially now we are waiting for the third dose of vaccine in vulnerable groups. It means we have to put off as many infections as we can for as long as we can because we're getting this third dose of the vaccine now. And we know that's going to boost immunity or put the immunity back to where it was after the Two, two or three weeks after two or three weeks after the second dose of vaccine or hopefully even better well hopefully even better than that um increasing uh, cases remain the earliest warning sign that hospitalizations are likely to rise so as cases increase that means hospitalizations will uh, rise over the next few weeks although nothing like as much as they did there's clear consensus from the group uh, that high levels of homeworking has played a very important role in preventing sustained epidemic growth. So homeworking has worked. And they're also highly uh, confident that the decrease in homeworking, which is happening now over the next few months, will result in, a, a re in, in an increase in cases as well. So when people are working from home, they're just interacting less. So the group is saying that all this working from home that people have been doing, where they're able to do that, has reduced the, the spread. When people are going back to the offices, that will increase the spread. It's basically that simple. And again, these principles apply wherever you live. Uh, if enacted early enough, a relatively light set of measures could be significant to curb substantial growth. 
So we might need fairly light measures. And of course, the reason, as we've said for this, light measures can now have a big effect because there is so much community immunity. I won't use the term herd immunity, but let, let's not use the term immunity because immunity sounds absolute. Let's lose the term relative resistance to infection. I think that would be a, a better term. It's kind of partial immunity, isn't it, really, for a lot of people. Current status in the UK from the UK Health Security Agency. Our rate in England is between 0.9 and 1.1. The growth is between minus 1 and 1% 1 per day. So we're kind of flat to take your pick there, really, aren't we, as we did notice. But that's per day. We're not talking about very short doubling times here. But of course, that can take off, as we know. It's unclear how high prevalence and emissions may go without intervention. So... The cases are going to go up in, in autumn. We're going to see why in a minute. Reflections on modelling. So basically this group got it a bit wrong for the 19th. Um, now the factors in that, the, the factors, schools closed for the summer, which helped. Changes in behaviour. People did not go nuts. In Jonathan Van Tam's word, they did not rip, rip the pants off their freedoms. They were cautious and gradual, which is good. Changes in mixing patterns have been more gradual than the group were hoping for, which is good. Basically, a lot of people have been highly responsible about this and highly cautious. Um, the population has not reduced their cautious behaviour as dramatically as was considered possible. We've had a heat wave, so people have been outside most of the time. It's been a fantastic summer. More sunshine, more people outside more of the time. In more sunshine, of course, you make more of this stuff which on this channel we believe is highly, highly important. Vitamin D and people move inside, breathing each other's airs when air when it gets colder, um, more confined environment, shutting the window because it's cold and drafty, and of course make le making less vitamin D because there's less sunshine. Larger proportion of the population have been isolating as well after being identified as a contact case. So compliance basically with isolation measures after after it's been people have been informed that they've been exposed to a case has been pretty good. It's been pretty good. So Imperial College London modelling pessimistic scenario assumes three years uh, average duration of infection induced immunity. So they're pretty confident this is going to be longer than vaccine produced immunity. Does not consider any variants beyond the Delta, so that's still an unknown, what's going to happen with new variants. Peaks occurring in October to, De October to December instead of August to October. So, in other words, they had thought with the July openings that August to October would be the high peaks. Now they still think they're right about the shape of the peaks, but they just think they've been pushed back delayed and it does make sense now you look at it so they believe now the peaks are going to be October to December which is a pity because it means we're going to have peaks in the winter months as opposed to in these earlier summer months so for those reasons we looked at they've revised these models um, it does make a lot of sense what they're saying now I believe and um, I, I agree with them now that October to December so starting about four weeks time, October to December is going to be the peak. After that, I'm confident that in early, early next year, we're going to start saying goodbye to a lot of the aspects of this pandemic. But we've got this first part of the winter to get through yet. And that's true wherever you are. In, if you're living in a part of the world where vaccination rates are very low, I'm afraid you've got much longer to go than this. Um, highest levels seen in step far road map scenario will not be reached. So the highest, the, 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 the terrible predictions that we had won't be reached um, unless immunity wanes a lot, unless there's a lot of waning of immunity or there's a novel variant emerges. And I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't think that's going to happen quickly. So I, I'm pretty happy that, not how I wouldn't say happy, I, I'd say I feel confident that we're not going to get to the very, very high levels of hospitalisation that were feared at one stage, although the delays in the peaks are going to be as we've said, uh, October, November, December is going to be the peak times. And I believe it's going to be very, very similar for the United States as well. Um, so behaviour was assu um, assumed to be consistent across groups. That's not really true because um, if those at higher risk of uh, uh, getting sick and dying from COVID take greater precautions, levels of, hos of hospitalisations and admission could be lower in those in those groups. And this does seem to be the case that the older people and the ones with comorbidities, comorbidities who are more at risk of getting sick 
have been more uh, careful in their guarding and precaution taking. Uh, vaccine effectiveness estimates continue to be refined. We still don't really know. We've got a bit to learn about this. And they're refining these and altering their models accordingly weekly. There's now uh, evidence of waning vaccine effectiveness, particularly 140 days after the second dose. Um, we know that's the case now, unfortunately. Those individuals vaccinated in late 2020 or early 2021, therefore, will have less protection in the coming months, but we know that they're going to start getting a booster dose in the UK and increasingly in the United States, and in the United States as well. Uh, uh, the third dose of booster vaccines, which are to be given, will reverse the waning of the protection and will limit the impact of waning uh, immunity. So um, third dose is basically going to reset the clock therefore best to get infected to the natural infection after the third dose now that we know that's going to be available. So policy clarifications, third dose for over 50s in, in the UK, we know that's happening. Vaccines have been sent out centrally to, uh, from, to Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, all over. Uh, everyone's going to get that in the UK as it is available in the United States as well. And chief medical officers in England Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales have now advised that we start vaccinating 12 to 15 year olds. Um, all the chief medical officers have made the same decision. One imagines they've had a conference call about it and they're, they're, they're demonstrating a bit of pack behaviour here, but they're all singing off the same hymn sheet. So the four chief medical officers are all agreeing on this. And uh, the JVC, I did kind of pass the book on to them to make the decision and, and they made it. So that's that's the way this system works. So vaccines are now being offered for 12 to 15 year olds. Um, individual choice, of course, on, on that family choice, children's choice. Um, if acute COVID-19 combines with other pressures. Now, this is concerning. Is there going to be a lot of pressure from the NHS on long COVID? Well, from long COVID. There's going to be some, for sure. There's some already. There's about 80 clinics set up around the country already. How big is this going to get? We don't really know that one yet. Other infectious diseases, well, we know these are going to come along. Um, there's influenza is going to come along, probably not a bit later on, probably sort of November, December. Respiratory syncytial virus, loads of that already in children. Norovirus, a lot of that already. And the other thing that concerns me is co-infection with SARS coronavirus 2 with other infections. We know from data from winter in uh, early 2020, uh, when people were still getting influenza and were getting uh, getting SARS coronavirus 2 infection, if they had both infections at the same time, they got more critically ill. So influenza vaccine is going to be absolutely vital this season as well and of course that program has already started mum had hers last week which i must say i thought was a bit early i'd much prefer to have it in um where are we now middle of september uh, i much prefer to have it in about four or five weeks time but that, that's the way the programs are working because the immunity from influenza vaccine is a bit short-lived unfortunately but uh, we don't want influenza and uh, covid at the same time Medium term projections. Now, th 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 this group um, say these are neither forecasts nor predictions. So this is what we call uh, some A&E departments talk about a CMA medicine um, uh, to uh, sort of make sure that if uh, things go a bit wrong, it's not your fault. Uh, so they're sort of putting that disclaimer in. This, of course, stands for cover my. I um, can't remember what the A stands for, actually. Cover my something or other anyway. Um, so that seems to be what they're doing there. OK, would have thought they'd be take a bit more ownership than that, but there you go. Uh, cannot fully reflect recent changes in transmissions that have not yet filtered into the surveillance data. OK, that is a fair point. They can only work with the data they've got. And then we looked at that eight week scenario there with this. Um, this uh, th this red potential graph there so this is what we've already looked at uh 1.1 much more likely to be uh 1.1 much more likely to be the green scenario uh, much more probable um but blue is is also considered likely 
uh, red is considered uh, possible but highly unlikely. So let, let's hope uh, hospitalizations are well down here. But even this is a lot, even this is high, putting some strain on the NHS and, and further delaying people were desperate for other treatments as well. This is not the only disease the NHS has to treat. So um, potentially 2,000 cases a day, as we've said, quite easily if the, uh, if the R value is 1.1. And this is actually uh, for a potentially protracted period of time, as we've noticed. This could be over uh, two months or, or two and a half months. A few difficult months for the healthcare sector, direct quote. Warning signs, how do we know things are going to go badly for hospitalisations if they do? Number of cases will increase. Positivity rate will increase, detected by the Office of National Statistics. The percentage of people testing positive, the positivity rates over like it goes up to 10% of those tested those tests come out for positive, that will be a warning sign. Age profile of those infected, if older people are getting infected, greater risk of hospitalisation. And then I've, I've added a few question marks about declining immunity, question marks about new variants, question marks about radical behaviour change, and question marks about the 5 million people that aren't yet vaccinated. So they're not the committee's ideas, that was just me adding my uh, tuppence worth. Timing of interventions, as we've said, um, um, a basket of measures light enough to keep the epidemic flat will be sufficient if enacted when hospitalizations were at a manageable level. We're talking about low levels of intervention having a big effect. So low levels of intervention, big effect. It's not the same as last year. It's not the same as that. Moderate interventions would have a much bigger effect because we have so many people immune. If the epidemic were allowed to uh, continue uh, until hospitalizations were at a higher level, then it would be obviously a big, much bigger problem. More stringent measures would be needed. Um, finally, the group talk about nature of interventions. If enhanced early enough, a relatively light set of measures could be likely sufficient to curb sustained growth. So we're talking about light sets of measures here. More widespread testing. Yes. A return to requiring all contacts of cases to isolate may well be necessary. More mask wearing in public. And of course, all the other things we know about so well now. Uh, ventilation, meeting outside, not meeting indoors and limiting close contacts between households indoors. Uh, given a high number of susceptible people in the younger age groups, um, measures targeted towards the younger age groups may have a disproportionately large effect, partially because the older age groups are being more cautious. So there we are. Pretty long uh, update today. Thank you for sticking with it. But I think that's very important because that's the best information we have so far on um, the best information we have so far on what's going to be happening over the next few months on, on basically, I think, on both sides of the pond. Now, that's the end of the talk. Thank you for listening. Now, I just want to show you something. Just something happened to me this morning, which was quite, quite funny. Um, I, I was just getting the train back from Manchester because I've been working away, as I said. And uh, here, here we have the sign that I was looking for. This is going to go to Manchester to, to Carlisle. It was, this was before my train came this morning. And um, that's the train station there. And you shall see that, 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 that uh, that's nice and clean, that sign. <laughs> it's just one of these silly stories, really. It's nice, 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 clean sign, which, of course, is great. We want clean signs, obviously. But there was two. There was, there was a guy... The, the, the funny bit is there was a guy cleaning the sign with a special long brush doodah thing. Then there was another guy with a like a big mobile phone thing, like a tablet, and he, he was taking pictures of it. And I said, <laughs> just joking to him, I said, he put in that on YouTube. He said, no. He said, when this guy's cleaned it, I've got to take a picture of it. <laughs> so, so there was one guy going around doing cleaning. <laughs> another guy, this other guy was walking around with him, taking pictures of what the guy had done. And then I said, but who do you send the pictures to? They said, oh, well, we send them into the office. <laughs> they send them into the office where someone else must be looking at the pictures. So you've got one guy doing the job, one guy taking pictures of it, another person looking at the pictures of the person who took the pictures of the person doing the job. And presumably we have some bean counter putting it all on a spreadsheet somewhere, reporting it to some boss somewhere. So you have about four or five people involved in, in, in one man doing the job. 
But as we see, um, we are pleased to say that the screen was very clean and I was able to get my train on time. But it, ju it just occurred to me, the inefficiencies, and, you know, I've just, I was just thinking about that, you know, kind of making a serious point, really, that some of the weird stuff that's gone down over the past 18 months or two years, um, you know, really makes you wonder if mass insanity has somewhat broken out and the, the lack of just common sense that seems to have been applied at a personal level all the way up to a, a, an international agency's level. I'll leave that with you to reflect on. I just wanted to share that. I just thought it was quite funny, the inefficiencies, but, but then you know, there's always a moral behind the story, isn't there? Long one today. Thank you for sticking with me. Um, I was going to tell you about uh, impotence and testicular swelling. Um, let me just tell you not to worry about it after the vaccine. It's not a problem, uh, but I'll give you some more information on that tomorrow. Uh, it, it is a myth. You do not get impotence after the vaccine. You do not get testicular swelling after the vaccine. But more on that tomorrow. I've talked enough. Thank you for watching.